grandmother had told her to stay away from him, he was the son of Dirty Swallow, the rattlesnake woman. Baptist Yellowknife's mother could direct the rattlers to do her bidding. Last summer, a rattler had tapped the back of her grandmother's skirt as she sat on the stick game lines. Her grandmother had won too much of Dirty Swallow's money, and she wanted it back. Now, the son of Dirty Swallow wanted something from Louise. Louise knew Dirty Swallow was inside the house. Dirty Swallow had come to Old Machise's wake, and she had come to visit the day Louise's mother had died. The dry weeds had crackled with rattlers. Both times, Florence had scrambled to a place where the rattlers couldn't get to her. As she came closer, Louise could hear Dirty Swallow's voice. Dirty Swallow was, was walking, pacing her grandmother's kitchen in circles. As Louise stepped on the porch, she heard the dry rice sounds of rattlers retreating. Get out of my house, her grandmother was saying to Dirty Swallow, but Dirty Swallow was not listening to her. Dirty Swallow stood still in the center of the kitchen. There was a sense of movement around her, a draft of spining air. Her skirt was soft over her, her fat hips and worn so thin in places Louise wondered if she was seeing flesh. She appeared in my headlights, sudden and brilliant, an apparition I could taste at the tip of my tongue, bitter metal on the backs of my teeth, Louise. There was a slash rip across her blouse, and her skirt was torn and ragged. It occurred to me after it was all over she must have been bleeding badly, because all I remember when I think about seeing her that night is the red wet back of her arm as she shielded her eyes from my car lights. I heard Louise shift in the back seat, and I uncovered her face to check on her but I really just wanted to see her face. Even in the thin moonlight, with her face swelling, she was beautiful. I looked at my watch every few seconds. I counted the median lines as far as I could see in both directions. I checked my watch again. Only 10 minutes had passed since I found Louise. I waited. I had too much time to think. She sees the moon moving high above the fields, catching light in the sleeping pockets of water. The valley is winking with smooth palms. The water, light. All the fields are dry now. The clouds lit by the moon are water passing. It is close to harvest, and she is dreaming beneath this moon the way her grandfather dreamed. His cap of magpie feathers pressed to the sky. With power, she feels the movement of things, and even the still night air has weight. Louise feels the night in her throat, in her skin, water heavy. Louise watched brilliant strikes split the sky. Sky curled back purple-gray, where lightning in October. She'd only been to Wallace once before. She had liked the steep mountainsides and the whistling miners. I had watched Harvey Stoner as he watched slow sunlight flood the stained glass windows. The day was so dry with cold. My heater rattled. The mountains were edged with the morning light. The stars were thinning out to the morning sky. Mist smoked above the river. The sun had risen to meet our eyes. The light was so bright I was almost blinded. Death rose over the powwow grounds in the hottest part of summer. Death raided the edge of the highway, fluttering silver water. Death could enter the dance arena as sleek as a silver deer. Death bones rattled in the hands of stick game players when they began thinking of spending their last silver dime. Death was the glittering light the hunters followed, the light Annie White Elk had followed. Death was the weak-hearted smell waiting in the sweet huckleberry bushes. Death was the silver smile along the river line that I'd call Louise's sister. Death was clear light, the film of night fading. Hey, hey, hey. 